Would you please turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. We're in the second week of our new series, Acts, We Welcome Jesus Church, Power, Progress in People, and uh, follow along, most importantly, in the Bible, as well as on, with that message outline. It looks about like this, and, um, and then on the right side of it, or on the back side, whichever one you have. There is a series outline as well. But the book of Acts, is in, in there, is recorded the history of the early church. And you think about it, Jesus is crucified, he resurrects, and then a month later he ascends into heaven. The Spirit comes, the early church is formed, and it begins functioning. And the book of Acts records this transitional period of the early church and its formation. And, and wild things uh, kind of happen when you look in the book, and hopefully you maybe spent some time reading it. And the tongues of fire descend on people's heads, and there's healings, and there's raisings from the dead, and crowds gathering to hear the gospel, and disciples uh, get thrown in prison sometimes. Others get killed. Uh, missionaries are being sent out to areas beyond Jerusalem. There's philosophical arguments, uh, shipwrecks, wild dreams, there's riots, all kinds of things happening. And last week, we looked together at the first part in chapter 1, and it's kind of similar to a scene from a presidential campaign, which we're in the middle of now, and maybe many of us don't really like it. And in the battle for the vote, only one nominee wins, and the scene at the losing headquarters becomes more and more somber in that election night. It's the loser's scene. And all the work and the toil and the pain and the long days, the sacrifice, oh man, it's just all for nothing. And their people are weeping and, and trying to you know, maybe keep a, put a brave face on the situation, but wondering if it was all worth it. All is lost and hope is gone. That's much like Jesus' disciples after the crucifixion. There's weeping, there's no hope, there's confusion, there's discouragement. All is lost, everything's changed. All the great promise, the vision, it's gone. There's nothing left. Then beyond hope, right? Almost beyond belief, the resurrection. And that changes everything. And Jesus is back. And, and if you have seen him, he's alive and he's talking and he's planning and he's readying his disciples for the next step. And there's euphoria. There's excitement. Anything can happen. Now, what next? And there's this waiting with anticipation and the resurrection changes things. And in the opening chapter of Luke's book, uh, we're encouraged to follow the lead of the resurrected Jesus. In those three key questions we asked last time, will I act on life-changing and church-changing truth? Will I accept my appointment to active testimony? And as Jesus reveals his will for me, will I follow? And if you take your outline you might have, and you look on that right side or on the back of it, you can see where we're going with our entire series for this, uh, for our study in Acts. In our key verses in Acts 1, verse 8, we, we reviewed that last time. How will I react to the birth, development, and expansion of the early church? That's your key question for the whole series. And we our life response is we receive the Spirit's power to engage gospel progress as God works through his people to grow Jesus' church amidst opposition. And so if you look at that whole series outline, you can see gospel progress in the first several chapters. And in the middle, this gospel progress in Judea and Samaria and Syria starts in Jerusalem. And then gospel progress all the way on the road to Rome. And there's a couple key pivotal people. Starts with Peter and then transitions to Paul, but there's many others in there as well. But spread throughout, and you can see that near the bottom of that, of that series outline, is the Spirit's power. And I just recorded a couple, well, several, a lot really, uh, verses that show that, but that's not an all-inclusive list. And so that's our big series, but we're zooming in a week at a time in different sections. This week, we're zooming in on chapter 2. And chapter 2 introduces us to the Feast of Weeks. It's an annual Jewish celebration. And so from the time of Moses, about 1,400 years before, the Israelites had a series of celebrations or feasts that are designed to honor God. And in this case, this Feast of Weeks, it's to honor God for the summer wheat harvest. And it was celebrated seven weeks plus one day 
after another feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we've already looked at a little bit. And so that's seven weeks plus a day equals 50. And so it was called the day of Pentecost or 50th. And so that in Jesus' day it was called that. In fact, we still call it the day of Pentecost because it marks the beginning of the church. And so we receive the power of the Spirit of God himself. And we see this in Acts chapter 2. We receive the power of the Spirit. We follow Jesus' lead, but now in Acts 2, we receive the power of the Spirit. Look at verse 1 with me. We engage the Spirit's presence and power through faith. And on your outlines, we open up to God's revelation of himself. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. So they've been waiting, remember? Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So about 50 days earlier, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit is coming. Now we have the disciples all together, probably in a home there, like like it says, a loud sound, much like a rushing wind, and what appears to be a flame separating and resting on each of them. This is kind of a dramatic scene, I think. And filling in a few blanks, because we know the whole history here, and we know the rest of the story, we have the coming of the Holy Spirit in a very unique way. And it's it, there's wind, and there's fire, and I imagine that hearts were racing, and there's probably sweating a little bit. And the Holy Spirit, in this transition period, makes quite an emotion-altering entrance. And around about this time, if you're looking at this and you say, well, that's kind of a wild scene, and and you might be saying, well, I'm a believer in Jesus, and uh, I'm a Christian, and I think I have the Spirit of God, and I don't remember no wind and fire. And and, and what's up? And and you got to keep in mind here, when we deal with these types of questions, that this is a transition where Jesus is introducing something new. And in this transition from Jesus' physical ministry now to the coming of the Spirit and the start of the church, he wants to make it really obvious that he's working. And he wants to clue us in to let us know in very significant supernatural ways that he's working. And it's like someone showing up at your door in regular clothes, right? And then they claim to be a police officer. And they want to be let in. And if you didn't know the person, you'd want to see some ID first, right? Uh, Maybe a uniform, and it'd be handy if there's a police car parked out front. Then maybe you'd believe in the identity of the police officer. In a similar way, during this key event, the start of the church, this transition period in Acts, God is going to announce his work in all kinds of miraculous ways to get his people used to the idea of what he's doing, what he's doing, and to authenticate that he's working. And in this case, hurricane-like winds and flames of fire. So we might not get the flames of fire and the the big winds when, when the Spirit fills us today. But what hasn't changed is how God works in these kind of external signs. God's process for revealing himself to humanity involves some type of external sign like we see here. Some type of revealing of who God is. And it might be through the Bible or it might be through the testimony of another Christian, or it might be through his creation. Millions upon millions have received input from God via an external sign, something outside themselves to which people respond with curiosity, with questions, and the Holy Spirit begins nudging. And these external signs is God reveals himself, especially in his word, especially, of course, through his son, That's the working of the Holy Spirit. God reveals himself and he moves within us and then we have a choice to make. We can respond in faith or not. And in chapter 2 here, the disciples had already responded in faith. But this is a transition time. So the Spirit, Spirit hadn't arrived yet. They had put their faith in Christ and he was still around. But now he's gone. He's ascended into heaven. So now the Spirit is coming And so he's there. They already have this faith. They're receiving Christ for forgiveness of sins, and they're trusting in his death, burial, and resurrection. And that leads to them being able to receive God's Spirit. And that's what I put on your outlines in the next part there. We answer with faith to receive God's Spirit. 
we open ourselves up to the fact that God reveals himself in creation through another Christian, so through someone sharing the gospel, through his word, as we, as we learn more about Jesus Christ. And then we answer with faith, and then we get this filling of the Spirit as well. Look at verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And so all of them, all the disciples, the followers of Christ, were filled with the Holy Spirit. And in fact, looking back, and again, knowing the whole story, they were all baptized by the Holy Spirit. And that's how Jesus talked about this event in chapter 1. Remember, he said, don't leave, but wait for the gift my, my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be, what, baptized with the Holy Spirit. And even Luke here, this writing this book, a, a little later in his book in chapter 11, Luke records Peter referring back to this event that we're looking at right now as the initial baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit comes with the external signs, the Spirit enters in, they're filled, they're baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we're all given the one Spirit to drink. So in this initial one, in this transition period, the baptism of the Spirit came after Jesus ascended into heaven and after the disciples had already put their faith in him. But as Paul mentions, like a little later in, in the history of the church there in 1 Corinthians 12, the baptism of the Spirit is given to every believer at salvation. So in this transition period, belief came, then later the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but now Today, we have the Spirit of God and His baptism from the very beginning, the moment of our salvation. In fact, this baptism ushers us into the body of Christ, the church, the family of God. So we answer with faith to receive God's Spirit. So the body of Christ begins here. Acts chapter 2, in this baptism of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit produces quite an effect the Spirit enables these disciples to speak in other languages, and that is in other languages beyond their own language, their native language. And I put on your outlines this as you look at those first four verses, and looking at these first few verses, are you open to God's revelation in your life? Are you open to hearing, hearing from someone that already knows Jesus? Are you open to looking out in creation and acknowledging that there's a designer and a creator? Are you open to investigating God's word? Are you open to that nudge of the Spirit of God in your life? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins and to receive his Holy Spirit? I put a key question in red there. Whose influence am I trusting? Here we see the presence and the power of the Spirit showing up. And if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit's presence is with you, and his power resides in you, are you trusting in his influence in your life? Or, sometimes, are you trusting in your own efforts, your own strength, or, or maybe the power of your own personality, or maybe the power of some other movement or influential person in your life? See, God wants to be the most influential presence and power for our life, for eternity, and, and our day-to-day -day life. Now, so let's continue looking, looking in verse 5. So in that first four verses, we can engage the Spirit's presence and power through faith. Starting in verse 5, it's kind of a lengthy section. We can expect the Spirit's work to change everything. When the Spirit shows up, whoa, everything changes. And I put on your outlines for that first section, trust the Spirit's work to produce some reactions. So we see that, verse 5. Now they were staying, that now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. When when God shows up, things can go crazy sometimes. Because each one heard their own language being spoken, and utterly amazed, verse 7, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Uh, then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? And Parthians and Medes and Elamites and Residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we are hearing them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. And amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? 
Some, however, made fun of them and they said, uh, well, they just had a little bit too much wine. See, we can trust the Spirit's work to produce reaction. The Holy Spirit's work in the life of his disciples really changes things and it produces reactions in others. So the wind draws a crowd, then all these folks able to speak languages that uh, beyond their own, people notice what, wow, I can, I can understand this guy. He's speaking, he's speaking my language. What's happening here? These guys are just Galileans and, well, they're, you know, they're kind of backward and they don't get out much. Oh, when did they get sophisticated enough to speak all these languages? What's going on? See, God is announcing himself. It's as if God is saying, pay attention. I'm doing something significant. Watch what's happening. I'm going to throw on a little extra here for a while. I won't always do it this way. But for now, at the beginning, catch all this stuff. See what I'm doing. I'm confirming my work. My spirit is there, and it's announcing my blessing and, and approval on this new wave of my work. Catch the wave. Stay with me. These are people speaking no languages, they did, known languages that they didn't know a few seconds ago. Something out of this world is going on. I better pay attention. So let's see this model so far. And, and I like this model here that we, we can maybe skip and miss. God reveals himself. The disciples answer in faith. This experience produces a reaction. I'm thinking that might be a, a model, God's model for his church today as well. We receive a revelation or a sign from God through his word, through the witness of his people, through his creation, or maybe even a miracle in our life as the spirit zeroes in closer. And eventually in faith, through the work of the Holy Spirit, we respond in faith. And then we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit we experience this internal change. The Spirit of God resides in us, and all this produces some type of external response. People notice we've changed. We're different. Our loves, our priorities, our values are changed and are changing. And then people respond to our faith in Jesus Christ. And so this pattern in the early church is God's pattern for the church today. External sign, internal response of faith the baptism of the Holy Spirit all rolled into one, and the external response is people see our changed life. And we might not speak a new language you know, right away. We're not in that transitional period. We don't go backward to the book of Acts. But you never know what might happen when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. But as we see here, you know, notice that the response to the Spirit of God isn't always positive. Even in the midst of this awe-inspiring scene, some are saying, oh, come on, um, stop your drinking. You've had a little too much alcohol. And even in the face of the obvious, some will respond with hostility. Well, let's finish up the pattern here because it doesn't stop with just the first three points. This is where it gets, I think, pretty good. The next step in the pattern is why we're celebrating Jesus Christ today, 2,000 years later. The next step is spiritual impact. And remember back to Peter before the, the crucifixion. Well, I don't, I don't know the guy, you know, while Jesus is going through the trials. And a little girl, leave me alone. I'm not his friend. Or blankety blank, 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 blank. You know, I'm not telling you. I don't know the man. And then the rooster crows, and Peter has, den has denied his own Lord three times. But now the resurrection. Jesus seen with Peter on the beach around the campfire, asking and telling Peter, do you really love me? Then feed my sheep. And now weeks later, Peter's here. This is the culmination. This is the final piece. Resurrection, of course. But for continuing spiritual impact, the disciples needed the resurrection plus the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Peter is changed dramatically, utterly, completely, and forever. He is just changed. And he has a few missteps here and there. And, but his spiritual transformation is sealed and it's locked in at this moment. And this guy here is unbelievable because he begins to partner with the Spirit in spiritual impact. The Spirit's presence and power is here, and then he lets us join in. He uses us. We're his ambassadors. We're, we're, we, we get to be reconcilers with him. We get to be the junior partners with the Spirit of God. And Peter begins to partner with God's Spirit. And in the midst of a chaotic scene, in the power of the Spirit of God, he raises his voice and he partners with the Spirit in spiritual impact. Let's just look at part of it. Look at verse 14. So Peter stood up with the eleven, and he raised his voice, and he addressed the crowd. 
So the Spirit is coming. Here's what Peter says. It was bold. It's, it's exciting to, to see this. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully what I have to say. These people aren't drunk, as, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And he says in verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. And this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And he just keeps going and going and going. Jump to verse 36 now. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, and when the people heard all this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he just kept going and going and going. For with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Wow, that's good stuff. The spirit changes everything. And then Peter partners with the spirit in spiritual impact. And people repent and they change their mind and their heart about who Jesus is. And they respond in faith and they follow up their faith with baptism. And the gift of the Holy Spirit is for all of them, even for those that are coming in the future or who are far away that haven't heard yet. See, that's God's pattern for the church. And this is quite a startup. What a way to get things going. So the Spirit changes everything. Let me ask you a question. It's the question in red in this section. As God works... As God works in his presence and power, do these, do these wonderful things. Am I contributing in that work? Am I contributing to his work? Because I love what Peter does here. He partners, and he's the junior partner, but he partners with the Spirit. God says, I want to use you. Apostle Paul says, you're Christ's ambassadors. As God works in wonderful ways, am I contributing? Are you contributing? Is our church contributing to his work? Let's look at the last few verses together, starting at verse 24, at 42. We enter into spirit-filled church partnerships. We enter into spirit-filled church partnerships. We can expect the spirit to work, right? And that changes everything. And we can expect, you know, and engage the spirit's presence and power through faith. But here, there's, there's some follow-up. It's not just a kind of a one-day deal and the excitement kind of fades. No, it changes all kinds of things. And we enter into these spirit-filled, spirit-empowered church partnerships. Look, verse 42. And I put on your outlines, they serve in biblical teaching and life fellowship. They serve together in biblical teaching and in life fellowship. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. There's the two, teaching and fellowship. To the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles and all the believers were together. They had everything in common, and, and they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And I love this. See, they served together in biblical teaching, and they served together through their life fellowship. 
and they're voluntarily sharing things together. Not just their stuff, because we look at that, well, that kind of, it's kind of concerning, right? It's not just their stuff, but they share in prayer. They share in meals. They share in purpose and in close connection and in service and in giving and receiving of biblical instruction. And look what happens in verse 47. They're praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. They're having this impact in the broader community, and, and people notice. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I put in this on your outlines. We share in God-directed praise and effective witness. So we serve in biblical teaching and life fellowship, and we share in God-directed praise and life fellowship. They're praising God, and, and the Lord is adding to their number. So that's the effective witness part. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, putting these last few verses together in this final section sounds suspiciously like the, the series we just finished up, Sharing Life in Christ. Remember those five key elements, worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and witness? Folks, they're all right here, right at the start of the early church, all in a nutshell. There's that service, there's that praising part, there's that life fellowship part, there's that biblical instruction part, there's that effective witness part. It's all here in these few verses. So if we miss out on this kind of spirit-filled church partnership and, and being involved in God's family, we might be missing out on God's purposes for the church. I put on your outlines in red, am I sharing life in Christ in my church family? Am I sharing life in Christ with my church family in very connected and purposeful ways? Am I sharing life in Christ, in my prayer life, in my home, in, 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 with my stuff, with, with effective witness, with how we worship God together? In biblical teaching, am I engaged in teaching others? Am I receiving biblical instruction and letting that change my life? Am I sharing life in Christ in my church family? Now, I know there's some realists in the audience now. And I'm guessing maybe at least a few of you are thinking something like this. Well, God doesn't work that way now. Hey, I haven't seen any wind except that windstorm we had, but no wind, you know, in my house. No tongues of fire. and Man. When I share my faith, I get shot down. I get made fun of. People laugh. Nothing happens. God's not working today, Brian. It just isn't happening. And, and sharing my stuff and, and my life and sharing all those meals and in my home and, and all that prayer and, and Bible teaching, it, it's not happening. It's too impractical. God doesn't really expect things to happen like that now. God doesn't really show his presence and power now. That stopped a long time ago. And my response to that is, really? Really? I have quick questions for you. How did you hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let that just kind of sink in for a minute. If God hasn't been working in powerful ways for 2,000 years, how do we know about all this stuff? See, spiritual impact has been happening for 2,000 years in God's church. In generation by generation, thousands by untold thousands, billions of people across time and throughout the world. Your ancestors and mine. What other more powerful force has, been, has there been in the last 2,000 years and before that in the history of God's work through the Jewish people as revealed in the Old Testament? If God hasn't been working why has this book, the Bible, been the most powerful influencer in all of history? Why is the God-man Jesus Christ the most dominant figure of history by any historical standard? If there's a more influential cultural and historic heritage the one that, than the one laid out for us in the Judeo-Christian heritage, my history books don't describe it. See, God, folks, is caught up in a whirlwind of activity all over the world, at all times, throughout all history. And yes, there's resistance, and we'll see that, and we see that then, and we see it now. And at times we're discouraged by God's maybe local activity in the here and now. But even today, thousands upon thousands and millions upon millions of people are responding to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, more than ever before. See, spiritual impact continues. I only have to look as far as my own heart. 
How about your heart? Let's pray. Father, thank you for Acts 2, that we engage the Spirit's presence and power when we respond in faith to the gospel. And then, Father, your, your Spirit's work changes everything. It's not our personality or the force of our will. It's your will and your power. And then, God, you call us into these wondrous, beautiful, complicated, difficult, challenging church family relationships and partnerships where we learn together, we grow together, we worship together, we serve together, we follow you together. And then you do amazing things. Thank you, Father. In Christ's name, amen.